All right, everyone, it's time for Occult Literature, video number 278, Mysteries of the Great Operas. Link in the description, of course, to my edition of this work on Amazon. It's 115 pages, so an intermediate read. Second and third links to my books, blogs. I haven't made the blog post yet. I'm not quite sure which header technically to put this under. This work is Rosicrucian. Um, it's also just generally a cult. It's, it's sort of more amorphous. This is a Max Heindel work, so he was one of the main Rosicrucians uh, by this time. Uh, Pryor had been not a student, but a, a compatriot of Rudolf Steiner, actually, the founder of Anthroposophy, a former theosophist under Blavatsky. Really a complex history with some of these smaller orders. Now, that being said, though, this is a really fascinating work, actually. I'm not sure that opera is something that most people in the contemporary sense tend to be interested in. Like, like operas and Shakespearean plays and, and epic poetry and things like that, a hundred years ago were very, very popular because you didn't have television. You didn't have, you know, radio in the modern sense a hundred years ago, really. You didn't have video games. You didn't, didn't have the internet. It's a sad time. Uh, and, and so people went to operas and they also liked oratory. They liked public speaking. Uh, Heindel did this frequently, released a bunch of books of his lectures, but this, I believe, was a standalone work. And it's very, very good. And, and the analysis is this. He looks at Faust, Parsifal, some of these others, Tannhauser, and he's, he's analyzing them from the specifically Rosicrucian perspective. Part of this is uh, the idea that was very much in vogue at the time that the spiritual and the sexual were very much twain. So like in the story of Parsifal, un ultimately, it's, it's a symbolic polemic about the purification of the human sex drive. <laughs> That's how it's analyzed here. I don't entirely agree with the perspective of this era of the Rosicrucian order on all of these issues, but th there are definitely underlying symbolisms about this. And anytime you're talking about medieval troubadours uh, um, competing for a woman's hand, the sexual symbolism at the time was very, very much there. Uh, it just was hidden. And you find this in books of a contemporary nature, too, at that time as well, even in the analysis. Behind those, of course, he's not mincing words. He talks about the generative organs and the act of nocturnal lovemaking and things uh, in a way that at this time actually was kind of out there. Which is actually refreshing, because even some of these occult works, they, they definitely mince words. And so they'll talk about, like, C Cupid's arrows striking people, or the, the rights of Hymen, or <laughs> something like that, and it's really funny. I think Faust is my favorite of the particular operas listed here. It's probably you know, more or less the well-known. Uh, it's, it's an excellent play, uh, not, not play, opera, and you should actually watch it. There's like a dozen versions on YouTube sometime when you get the time to watch uh, Faust. And uh, the interpretation there is also somewhat sexual in nature, um, although it's more about spiritual ascendancy, according to Heindel. And this is the case for a couple of the other works as well. The, the idea of the ascendancy or the transformation of man, it was very much in vogue at the time, and he literally invokes the crawling out of the human race from Atlantis. Like, like in, the, in the sort of post-theosophical origin story of man was the idea that initially the world was without surface water, and it was basically a misty atmosphere. Everything was a shroud of mist and people were, you know, functioning at that time, and they sort of didn't have full modern cognition, and through the act of, of sex, literally speaking, and some of these interpretations, the, the mystic world sort of took on a different form. The atmosphere became airy, water separated from air, sort of an alchemical statement, very symbolic. Um, it follows loosely some traditions within Norse mythology, and it seeks to look at the overlap between that and other, you know, older spiritual systems. People were colonizing uh, the Eastern world at the time, and they were comparing Christian religion, in, in the free thinking sense at least, uh, with all of these other traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and you get schools of thought like this. Now, of course, some of the things said here are inaccurate. We, we know that the world was never a misty, amorphous land where, you know, water and air were the same thing. That never happened, uh, according to all science. He claims that cancer is incurable. We know, of course, that that's not the case. Nor, by the way, was it necessarily in the surgical sense back then, uh, although it tended to relapse, leading to that belief. Uh, but it is a really great book. Um, it's split into sections for each of the uh, great operas that are being analyzed. Again, I think Faust is the most interesting to me, but it's also, it's also all of these plays are outright spiritual things. Even beyond the symbolism, all of them have a specifically, explicitly spiritual bent to them. 
you know, what's the story of Faust? Selling your soul to the devil is kind of a religious and spiritual statement. So again, link in the description of my edition of this work on Amazon, second and third links to my books, blogs, uh, highly recommended. And I will be releasing about a half a dozen additional Rosicrucian works uh, in short order. I managed to, at the end of the book, it originally had an index of other works that were available for sale. That's a great springboard to find additional works actually to edit. I do this all the time. I did that with the creation series. and It's why I still have things to edit actually at this time. That's about all. Peace out.